as many of you may know, I went to Russ Camp, I have a shirt for it, uh, a couple weeks ago over in San Francisco, which was the first official meetup for Rust. Um, Rust is a language I've been working on learning for a few months now and that I'm really excited about. And I want to sort of make a presentation um, to give that to Rackspace. Um, for people who have written some in Rust, the first part of this may be um, a little redundant. Um, I want this to really be an intro um, and also sort of explorative. I mean, you can go through, you can talk about, this is you know the syntax for a function, this is how this goes, but I sort of wanted to look more at the features and ideas behind the language and maybe some of the things you'll actually come across when you first start to try using it. Um, this is an interactive series of slides, um, and so you can go to that URL at the bottom. Uh, I have it blown up on the next one, um, and actually follow along, and there's uh, little, uh, little interactive parts that you can actually try the code out with. So yeah. Um, so I was going to make this fully interactive, as in you could press a button in the slide and it worked. Uh, however, JavaScript integration is hard and that actually broke Reveal.js, I found out later, in some of its features. And so uh, as a compromise, there are links that link to um, the online interactive play.rustling.org. And again, here's a little bit more blown up of the URL if anyone wants to hop in. Um, a bit of a backstory, uh, Rust was created by Mozilla as a safe, practical, low-level language with a strong type system and no runtime. They advertise a few other things like concurrency, which I find a little debatable considering that there is no runtime and so you just have threads. Um, but it was started about five years ago in 2010 and just recently went stable within the last six months and it's been moving pretty quick since then. Uh, we're currently on 1.2 as of, I think, a week ago. Um, and in my opinion, I view it as a safe, modern C++, because most things that I would have written in C++ before, I now look to Rust to do. And so we're just going to hop straight in. Um, and so starting off really simple, this is Hello World. Um, and you'll notice the syntax is pretty minimal. Um, functions are just fn. The rest is about what you'd expect. Um, and print lines are actually macros, and so anything with an exclamation point at the end, uh, as it's standard in some other languages, is in fact a macro. Um, and you'll see macros used quite a bit through here. Rust has a pretty sophisticated system for them that lets you do a lot of cool stuff. And so, let's say we want to actually do a variable, which you know was sort of what I did the very first time I did this language. And so, anytime we declare a variable, we use the binding let, uh, which is telling the compiler that we should allocate space for it. Um, and then we can use a nice little bracket system just like in Python and we can print it. So nothing surprising there. Um, and we can even specify a type for it. So let's say we want to initialize this as a float64. And so however if we try to run this uh, we will meet a very common companion in the world of writing Rust which is the compiler. Um, the compiler enforces a lot of safety and memory and borrowing and a lot of guarantees in a lot of ways. And what this is telling us here, if you look, is we're expecting a float64 and we found an underscore is used to just mean unknown. And so it says, I don't know exactly what type 32 is, but I know you're trying to save it as a float64. Um, and one nice thing about the compiler actually after it went stable is there are these error messages you see here, E0308. So you can actually punch these into the compiler with a dash dash help, I believe, and actually get a full printout explaining the issue which is really nice. Um, but anyway, there's a few ways to do castings. The easiest one is just to add a dot zero. And so if we do this again, it'll work just fine. And so moving to something slightly more complicated, let's say we want to mutate the said variable. Well, we set it to 32, we print it, we say we're gonna change it to 33, and we print it again. Except again, we'll meet the compiler. Um, this time it's letting us know that we assigned right here a to equal 32, and then we're trying to do a reassignment. Um, and the reason this is an error is because by default, all variables in Rust are immutable. Um, now we can change this, and we will to fix this, um, but this is a nice safety guarantee that if anywhere you declare a variable without the mute syntax, which you can see here, um, it's guaranteed to be immutable. And so there's no issue or question about what happens to that variable. And so yeah, adding the mute syntax lets the compiler know, hey, it's cool to mutate this, um, and it works just to do the spec. And so there's some other cool features. Uh, here we're showing off blocks. And so you can actually just have, uh, yes? Can we ask questions? Yes, absolutely, I'm sorry. That was the first question. The second question is, uh, if you declare a variable as immutable and later on you want to mutate it, does that bother you? 
To my knowledge, no. You can either initialize a new mutable variable and then copy the value over. Um, but no, it lives for the whole lifetime of a function. Um, lifetimes is something you'll see me mention later on. It's sort of a more advanced concept in Rust that outstretched this 20 minute talk, but it's so tied into the language I couldn't escape it. Um, but no, to answer your question. And so blocks, uh, as you'll see here, are just arbitrary chunks of code. Uh, they get their own call space. And so if we want to set A equal to a code of execution, we can do that. Um, you'll notice the last line here does not have a uh, semicolon, and so it's actually returned. Uh, Rust gives you the option to use the return keyword for functions, but to my knowledge for blocks, you actually just have to leave it as the last value, and then it gets assigned to A. Um, however, functions are generally nifty things, and so if we want to take this little squared function and turn it into a function, or operation turn it into a function, we can do that. And so again here, nothing super surprising. We see that we can declare a function. Uh, we say that it takes an i32 and returns an i32. And then we use that same little syntactic sugar of just leaving the last line without a semicolon for it to be returned. But what if we want references? Uh, because this is a low level language. Um, references are the sort of non-cost abstraction Rust uses in reference to pointers. Um, so in all the documentation, you'll generally see the word references. It uses that because the compiler enforces a lot of rules around them and to sort of make sense as opposed to saying pointers can and can't do that. It's, it says references can and can't do this because that's part of the language, not part of the actual structure of the computer. Um, but we can do that. And so you can see here, we've changed our code a little bit. And so if you look up at our function, it now expects a ampersand mute and Ampersand mute means a mutable reference. And so in this case, it means a reference that we are okay with changing the value of. Um, and as you can see, we let A equal to value, and then we do our little bit of math and assign that back. Um, and I actually forgot a semicolon. There should be one there. And so you'll also notice that when we pass it in, we can actually just create one on the fly here. Um, the mutable part is very important if we just pass it in without that mute keyword, the compiler will again error saying that we have tried to pass in a reference and that it is expected to be mutated but can't be. And so, again, another safety feature. So is it X already mutable there? Like, is it, again, tell it it's... So this is getting into a little bit of the fun of fighting the compiler. Point, the, we are generating a pointer. We're not assigning it to a variable, but we're generating a pointer. And so, um, what we're saying is, is, to my knowledge, that we are okay with um, mutating the value of that point. Otherwise, it will consider it to just be immutable in every way. Can you have null references as default? No. Um, Rust will let you do unsafe code uh, when you start doing very advanced things. It strongly cautions against it, but obviously at low levels there are some times that you just need to do things that the language normally won't let you do. Um, but by design, unless you start telling the compiler to do unsafe things, then to my knowledge, no, you cannot have null references. Um, and so we'll hop over to another sort of simple concept in languages, structs. And so in this case, we have a struct for a car. It has two fields, uh, gas and miles, which are both float 32s. Um, and you can see here, this is really simple. We're actually just creating one, um, sort of standard syntax you'd expect for creating one. And then we're going to print it. Um, but in fact, if we try to do this, uh, once again, the compiler will complain. Um, and this is. Actually, I have to scroll to show you all this. This is a little bit of a eyes full. Um, but you can actually suck out a bit of useful information of this. And so in here it says, car cannot be formatted with the default formatter. Try using a semicolon, semicolon question mark instead if you are using a format string. Um, semicolon question mark says to do debug printing instead of regular. And um, as you'll see in a second, uh, printing is actually done through the trait system. And so you can have something that can be printed in a multitude of different ways depending on the circumstances. And so this says try to access a debug of it. And so if we throw that in and we try it again, you can see here we've just added that, uh, we'll get another issue. Um, but this one is also helpful. 
And so if we isolate it, it says uh, car cannot be formatted using the debug print. Um, if it is defined in your crate, which is their word for basically a whole project, um, add a hashtag derived debug. And so if we try that again, uh, we'll actually find that it works. And this hashtag bracket system is the way that your code communicates with the compiler at compile time. And this, um, this is actually a very simple example of a lot of cool things you can do with it. Um, Rust uses it to allow you to declare everything from which code is safe and unsafe, um, feature upgrades. Um, if you ever actually dig into uh, any well done Rust project, such as the compiler itself, you'll actually see that they use this system to mark when features become stable. And so um, when you're using it, you can actually backtrack and see different things like that. And so it's a very common thing to do in Rust. It's actually um, also part of how you can declare using things like plugins and macros. Um, but in this case, it basically says auto-generate a print function uh, for the debug level. And as you can see, it basically prints out the exact declaration of it. Uh, but what if we want to actually have a custom way to print it? Um, and this is where we'll meet the actual trait system for Rust. And so uh, we'll use the standard format module. And display is the standard print method, not the debug print method. You'll see down here we've taken out that little uh, statement of um, colon question mark. And all you do is you implement this function uh, for our struct car. And that requires one function, and that function is FMT, short for format. Um, and that takes a number of things. You'll see that we have an ampersand self here. Um, this is a little bit of syntactic sugar, basically saying pull a reference to the object that we're operating on. Um, one really cool thing that you can do in Rust, um, if you want to for some reason, is actually if you suck out that ampersand, the ownership system will say that you are asking for ownership of the object. It will grab the object, and once format is done, it will deallocate the memory. And so if we actually take out that ampersand and say that the function wants to own the object by having it passed in, then it will be gone at the end of this. And so we want that ampersand, obviously, because we want our function or want our struct to live past it. Um, that's sort of one of the cool examples of, of the strong system in Rust to do that sort of stuff. And it also takes a mutable reference to a formatter, and it spits out something called result, which we'll get to in a little bit, and then we have a write macro. And in fact, if you compile and run this, you'll see that it prints out our little string format uh, car with 10 gallons of gas and zero miles. And so there are three really cool things in this that I hit on. There's the trait system, um, which is really powerful, and this sort of just touches the surface of what it can do. Um, there's results, which obviously we haven't even covered yet. Um, and then write is actually a pretty sophisticated macro. Um, and I wanted to include at least one of these um, while also keeping the talk in time. And so I thought, you know, traits are really cool, but they're not really a new idea. Um, results are from functional programming. And advanced macros are way too complicated for a 20 minute talk. And so I decided that I would go with results, um, which, believe it or not, are actually enums. And so let's talk about enums. Um, enums in Rust can be standard things that you'd expect, sort of ways to just offer different options as opposed to using, you know, integers or strings or something. And so we see that with the first two examples here of the enums for a spaceship. We have cruiser or frigate. Um, but you can also pack other more sophisticated things in enums. And in this case, we can declare something called crew, which again offers that differentiation saying, you know, crew is different than frigate or cruiser, but can hold a value. Um, and we can actually even build that all the way up to the struct level, where we can have um, this owned enum differentiation that actually holds a struct inside it. Um, there are a few limitations to this. Uh, most commonly that it actually requires to know memory size at compile time. And so a lot of times you'll see uh, references in here to make sure that that's known, else the compiler will whine at you. Um, but we can do some cool stuff with that, like pattern matching. And so we can make a function called inspect, and we can pass in a spaceship, and we can say, hey, if it's a cruiser, announce it's a cruiser. Same for frigate. And if we pass spaceship crew, then we can actually suck that value right out of it. You can see here I, and just say print spaceship has, and then the number of crew. And we can actually do the same thing for the struct level, accessing all the struct values. Um, and so we can use this, just as you'd expect. Um, here we make a cruiser and uh, the Millennium Falcon and inspect each and it prints as you'd expect. Um, 
But there are some cooler things that you can do with traits, uh, especially that you can do generics. And so um, we are, here we can create a my option type, um, or enum, which has the options of either none or some t. And t is just a generic type. It can be implemented for whatever we want it to be. Um, and at compile time, Rust will actually generate one of these for everywhere that it finds it used by a different type. Um, and so we can do something cool with that. Uh, yeah, for anyone of you who have done functional programming, you may reference this or recognize this sort of pattern. Um, so we can do something such as return option. Um, and here it takes x, which is uh, an i size, which is their sort of standard way of just saying any integer. Um, and if it's z 0, we want to return none. Else, if it is a number, we'll just return that number wrapped in sum. And uh, we see that we return my option. And the way that we declare what that t is, what we're expecting the type to be back, is with these brackets. And so we expect it to return a my option with i size. Um, and in fact, if you run this, you can again do pattern matching on it and say, if it's none, awesome. If it's sum, return something. Um, and as it turns out, this is literally the exact thing that is built into the Rust language. And so here it is simply built uh, with the standard syntax where I've just taken the my option off. And so this is a really cool way to handle different things. Um, result is built on this exact same idea, except instead of none, you have an error as the other option. Um, Rust does not have exceptions. And so this is how Rust handles um, sort of control flow if things go wrong. This is expecting you to return either a value or an error. Um, and there's a lot of cool macros that actually has built with this, such as the try clause, which will, or the try macro which will basically attempt an operation, and if it fails, it will automatically return the option for your specified type with the error packed in, and stuff like that. Of course, I promised that at the end of this talk, I would go through and look at writing an extension in Python and Rust. Um, I will go ahead and confess, I cheated a little bit. Um, there is a pre-built library to actually do this instead of building it purely from scratch. Um, but in my opinion, that's sort of what makes this really cool. Because uh, as you'll see, we get to write a Python extension in about 40 lines of code. And it just, it works. Um, and so the algorithm we're going to implement is the Fibonacci sequence. Something pretty standard. Um, I don't think anyone actually wants to read the algorithm for it. But here's how we extend it into Python. Um, and the first thing you'll notice is these fun little things here, which is this brackets, or not brackets, um, greater than, less than, with this tick p in it. Um, this is describing lifetimes. Um, lifetimes, again, is a very, maybe I shouldn't say very advanced topic, but a very complex topic that I couldn't cover in 20 minutes. Um, but what this says in short is that this sequence is going to reference the lifetime of where it was called from, and we'll use that when describing other things in here. Um, and in this case, uh, that lifetime p is actually tied to the um, Python interpreter. And so what that basically means is so long as the Python interpreter is in memory, this should stay in memory as well. Um, and as you can see again, we take the Python interpreter, args, keyword args, and we return a Python result. Um, and we do a little bit of matching and fancy extracting. And we basically say, OK, if we can successfully pull the number that was passed to us out of arg0, whatever the arg passed was, um, then uh, we can proceed with it, else error. And then we pass back an OK, and we reference that Fibonacci um, operation that we had. And we pass in arg0. So to actually extend that into being fully built into Python. Um, there's this fantastic little macro that was built into that. And it literally, you pass it basically what the .so you want it to generate is. And then uh, we try to add a doc operation for it, and then a fib operation, which is, again, this right here. And so this is it. This is the entire thing. And in fact, if you click the view all, you'll go to the Python file I have on GitHub that's roughly 50 lines or so. Um, and this will generate a dot so, and you can change into the directory of it. You can say import, um, where is it? Import libRust Python example, and it will suck it right in just like it's a regular Python module. So that's pretty cool to me. Um, and in fact, uh, I went ahead and made a little repo of doing this. Um, for the record, uh, the reference code actually does come from someone else, which I give credit to, but there were a lot of build errors that was outdated, so I 
went ahead and updated it. Um, so if you want to go back through here and check that out, you're welcome to. Um, and of course, I had to justify doing it. And so here's a fun little benchmark of it. Um, if you build it and then you run in that directory Python, try in Python, um, you'll get each of them. And then you'll see that uh, the Rust speed up factor is roughly 21 times. Yes, I did correctly return the wrong value for Python fib, which is why it's larger. It's actually one iteration more. And I did not catch that until I had already finalized the slides. Um, but regardless though, this is a neat 50 line way to really speed up an operation in Python if you want to. And so I'll end with a few closing thoughts. Um, one, there's a lot of things I left out that if you really want to do something in Rust, um, you'll need to know. Uh, there's Cargo, which is the build tool. Uh, you don't actually call Rust C really ever. Cargo is how you interact. It's how you manage crates, um, which are dependencies, all that stuff. Um, there's traits at a deeper level. There's macros at a much deeper level. There's other ways to work with memory. There's arc and RC, and I actually had box in here and had to cut it out for time reasons. Um, there's anonymous functions, which are fully supported, which I thought was really cool for a low-level language. Um, you can pass them around and everything. Um, there's modules. Rust has a specific way of how it handles modules and different, different files. Um, there's features, which goes back to that uh, hashtag bracket syntax and a lot more. Um, and what this really gets at is probably the biggest hurdle to starting Rust is that Rust in itself is a whole ecosystem. And so it's hard to just sort of be like, oh, I'm just going to learn this a little bit and do this a little bit. The second you start trying to you know, do much anything complex, you'll run into a lot of these things simultaneously. It's a little overwhelming. Um, and so I put a few things to look at if you're interested that sort of help me become acclimated and make that transition. Um, there's the book on the actual Rustlang website, which is a good little primer. Um, but doesn't go into much depth about a lot of things. Um, for more depth, rustbyexample.com is a git book that has a ton of stuff in it, which is really awesome. It's most of the stuff that I started with. Um, the IRC community is really cool. Um, it's still kind of small compared to a lot of languages right now, but it's very active. Um, I've never had any issue with getting help. Um, a lot of times they are busy actually working and discussing building the compiler in there, and so it's kind of cool to hang out. Um, and then the docs, um, the beautiful docs. Uh, Rustlang has a built-in way to generate documentation. In fact, when you're writing comments, if you add a bang, an exclamation point at the end of the comment line, it automatically considers it a doc comment. Um, and it will fully generate a standard documentation for you, including types, references, and all sorts of other stuff. And so I found that massively helpful. Any questions? Yeah. Sure. Or, John? When you're talking about macros, are you talking about um, something as simple as a C style macro, or is it purely at a textual level, or are you talking about something safer in Rust? So, the way Rust implements macros is that they are Rust code. Um, when Rust compiles things, it will actually compile the macros, make sure they compile correctly, execute them, make sure they execute correctly, and then build the result of them. And so, um, they're, very, they're very verbose. Um, the, uh, I'll go back. Um, let's see. This macro right here, Python module initializer, uh, is give or take somewhere between well, 150 and 250 lines. It's an entire, oh, um, it's an entire REST code function. And I have a question as well on here. What is my IRC nick on hashtag Rust? Um, it is hashtag code eight. Uh, and I think, does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Uh, John? Uh, you mentioned there wasn't a runtime. Is it just uh, build, just build binaries? So. Yes. I mean, uh, to be fair in the response I'm about to give, I don't have a whole lot of experience with low-level languages. Um, but what it compiles to uh, is, you know, interlocal C code, which is why Python can call straight into it. Um, in Rust, you can actually provide uh, one of those hashtag bracket no mangles, um, because Rust by default actually provides version numbers and a lot of other information with each function, and then it uses that information when it does compilation. And so it'll actually spit out ones without that. And so, yeah, no, you can, you can compile a .so and use it just like you would in C code. So truly no runtime. Um, 
early on, if you find old documentation, if you see anything from around 2013, at one point it actually did have a green thread runtime, but that was ripped out. So that was no more. Any other questions? The biggest advantage is the same reason why you'd want to write things in Rust versus C period, which is the safety. Um, Rust comes with a massive amount of safety things built in. Um, it will make sure, uh, going back to the slides, if you have a chance, things from you have to declare variables are immutable. By default, everything's immutable. It will do borrow checking um, to make sure that you are not uh, incorrectly loaning data. And so there's a lot of really cool things you can do with this. Um, I did not have time to show a threads example. but um, it actually keeps track of thread ownership uh, through an idea called closures, if I remember correctly. So when you start up a thread, you actually will declare what variables you want moved over to that thread. Um, and so if you try to start two threads in a row, passing it the same variable, um, it will actually uh, error at compile time and tell you that you cannot do that and that you need to find a better solution for that. Um, I will admit, starting out, there are times when Rust can be a bit frustrating because sometimes paradigms that you're used to doing because you know that it should work, um, but it is not algorithmically provable it will work, and it will therefore err. Um, but at the same time, being strongly typed and having that safety guarantees, uh, I have yet to write anything that basically doesn't work at runtime. I mean, obviously, you can have higher level issues if you don't correctly write your logic in. Um, but so far as having memory errors, memory leaks, um, concurrency errors, anything like that, the whole idea behind Rust is that's all solved at compile time by these strong rules. Oh. Um, the question is, do you see potential growth on adoption by sysops tools like it is happening on tools written in Go, like Terraform and Docker, uh, especially related to when rackers would use to manage things? Uh, in my opinion, yes. I think Go got a ton of following because it was the first thing that was easy to write um, that you could write low-level, lightweight stuff. I think uh, Lumberjack, which is used by Logstash, is a good example of that. Um, Lumberjack is a little program that you run on wherever you want your data harvested, and it made more sense to write it in Go than to write a big, heavy Java program for it. Um, I think Rust is well positioned to take that over. Um, I don't think Rust is as easy to write as Go. Um, Go is definitely super accessible, especially because it has garbage collection. Um, but I do think that it will definitely do a uh, sort of rebirth of low-level programming. Um, when I was at the conference, you actually saw sort of two total opposite ends of people there. There were a lot of game devs, a lot of C++ programmers, um, but a lot of the companies there and a lot of the people were, that were talking were actually Ruby Python shops who had needed to do high-performance stuff and they were 10-man teams and just didn't have the infrastructure or, as they said, the wizardry. Um, to write complex things in C or C++. It just wasn't viable for them to put in production. Um, but they actually now build a lot of stuff in Rust because um, they are confident in what that produces. Does that answer your question, Bruno? Cool. <laughs> Unit testing experience is really nice. Um, in fact, uh, no, I don't have it in a repo on GitHub. Um, so that same hashtag bracket, you basically uh, put that over a function. You say this is a test, um, and you expect it to be handed a test mutable reference. Uh, no, that's for benchmarking. Yeah, you just declare it as a test. And if you say cargo test, it will go, it will find all those, and it will run them. Um, I actually like it a lot more than Python because it lets you write the test directly below the function, which is my go-to. And so um, if I'm going to update a function, the test is right there, you know, 20 lines below it. Um, another really cool thing with it is benchmarking. It has benchmarking built in by default along those same means, and it'll hand you a benchmark um, object, and it'll basically let you do setup, and then you just pass it the operation you want done, and then it will go through and benchmark it. Um, I was actually testing out a fork join algorithm yesterday on threads and seeing how that worked out. So yeah, it's super easy. Um, I, I really love it. Any other questions? 
All right. Thank you all for coming.